Sulla now devoted himself entirely to the work of butchery. The city was filled with murder, and there was no counting the executions or setting a limit to them. Many people were killed because of purely personal enmities. They had no connection with Sulla in any way, but Sulla, in order to gratify members of his own party, permitted them to be done away with. Finally, one of the younger men, Gaius Metellus, ventured to ask Sulla in the Senate at what point this terrible state of affairs was to end and how much further he would proceed before they could expect a cessation of what was now going on. We are not asking you, he said, to pardon those whom you have decided to kill. All we ask is that you should free from suspense those whom you have decided not to kill. Sulla replied that he was not sure yet whom he would spare. And Metellus at once said, then let us know whom you intend to punish. Sulla said that he would do this. According to some accounts, this last speech was made not by Metellus, but by one of Sulla's creatures, called Fafidius. Then immediately, and without consulting any magistrate, Sulla published a list of 80 men to be condemned. Public opinion was outraged, but after a single day's interval, he published another list containing 220 more names, and next day a third list with the same number of names on it. And in a public speech which he made on the subject, he said that he was publishing the names of all those whom he happened to remember. Those whose names escaped his memory for the moment would have their names put up later. He also condemned anyone who sheltered or attempted to save a person whose name was on the lists. Death was the penalty for such acts of humanity. And there were no exceptions in the cases of brothers, sons, or parents. On the other hand, the reward for murder was two talents. And this sum was paid to anyone who killed a condemned man, even though it was a slave who killed his master or a son, his father. Also, and this was regarded as the greatest injustice of all, he took away all civil rights from the sons and grandsons of those on the lists, and confiscated the property of all of them. These lists were published not only in Rome, but in every city of Italy. No place remained undefiled by murder. Neither temple of God, nor hearth of hospitality, nor ancestral home. Husbands were slaughtered in the embraces of their wedded wives, sons in the arms of their mothers. And those who were killed in the passion of the moment or because of some private hatred, were as nothing compared with those who were butchered for the sake of their property. In fact, it became a regular thing to say among the executioners that so-and-so was killed by his big mansion, so-and-so by his gardens, so-and-so by his hot water installation. There was, for instance, Quintus Aurelius, a man who had nothing to do with politics and who imagined that he was only connected with these disastrous events insofar as he sympathized with others who were in distress. He went, on, he went into the forum, and reading through the list of condemned, came upon his own name. Things are bad for me, he said. I am being hunted down by my Alban estate. And he had not gone far before he was cut down by someone who had in fact been hunting after him. That is from The Life of Sulla by Plutarch, which is found in this Penguin volume, Fall of the Roman Republic. So this, Fall of the Roman Republic, uh, this is your Sunday Penguin for today. This is a pretty good one. Now this is part of the lives of the noble Greeks and Romans that was written by Plutarch, uh, which was a large book that collected short biographies of famous Greeks and Romans. Uh, it, was, it was a volume that compared uh, two lives, like it would compare uh, Caesar with uh, 
Alexander the Great, for example, and he would take different Greeks and Romans and compa compare them with each other. And that uh, I actually have. I'm lucky enough to have that. I have that in this big book. Uh, this is uh, Plutarch, Lives of the Noble Grecians and Romans uh, that was put out by the Encyclope Encyclopedia Britannica. And the Encyclopedia Britannica was a wonderful thing back in the olden days. Uh, my grandparents had a set of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and I love to take volumes down and just read through and find out different facts about different things. It was a great time. It was my idea of fun. So yeah, it was a great thing, the encyclopedia. That was back when, you know, you could take one of these down and mostly get facts. Not like nowadays when you go on, go on the internet. But I digress. I know my, my dog has opinions on these things. So yeah, so I'm lucky to have this book because it is a pretty long book, The Lives of the Greeks and Romans. Uh, I have this big sucker and it's all double column, but it's a wonderful thing to have. And I really wish that Penguin would just publish uh, a big volume of the whole thing. They really should. Um, they should at least have it available. But what they did, they did an interesting thing where they, would, they broke up the lives and put them in different volumes based on theme. And the theme on this particular one is the fall of the Roman Republic. And it is a very good volume, and it is pretty riveting reading, actually. This volume has the lives of Marius, Sulla, Crassus, Pompey, Caesar, and Cicero. Cicero being my favorite. Cicero was a really interesting fellow. He's, we know more about Cicero personally than anyone else who lived uh, in, ancient, in the ancient Roman Republic because all of his letters, not all of them, but a lot of his letters were saved and published. So we know an awful lot about Cicero, what type of person he was, his personality, all his faults and all his strengths. We know a lot about Cicero. And for all his faults, Cicero, it has to be said, he died trying to save his country. He, he saw what was happening. He saw that freedom was dying, at least the Roman Republic version of freedom, which wasn't really the freedom that we think of. But he saw that his country was being destroyed, that it was going to become a tyranny. And he did what he could to stop it, but he couldn't. So this is a fascinating volume because it, it does pretty well chronicle uh, the fall of the Roman Republic. Of course, the Ro Roman Republic didn't really officially fall until after the events in this book, after uh, the assassination of Julius Caesar. There was still a chance after that for the Roman Republic to survive. There was a war fought about that, but it Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, I guess, Augustus Caesar became the first Roman emperor. Augustus Caesar, who uh, was adopted by Caesar in Caesar's will. And so Augustus became a Caesar. And he became the first Roman emperor. He took control of Rome wasn't called a king. The Romans didn't like that term. Kings, of course, were frowned on in the Roman Republic. So for po political reasons, really, they all denied that they were kings. But essentially, that's what they were of Rome, and then they became, and they became, once they took control, the emperors of great sways of the world. Uh, the emperors controlled a lot. And the Roman Republic was just a memory. And the cracks started to form in the time of Marius and Sulla. It was discovered that all it took for a rich guy to conquer Rome was an army. You know, so if you were the general of an army, that army was really loyal to you, not to the Roman Republic, because you were the one who made sure that they got paid and everything. 
And so you basically, if you played your card cards right, you could have a republic, or an, you had an army that was loyal to you, and you could just march right into the city of Rome and take over if you, if you wanted to, and if you were lucky enough to get away with it. If your army beat whatever army was defending Rome, you know, you could take control, perhaps. That was kind of, they kind of figured that out in the time of Marius and Sulla. Sulla famously led a Roman army into Rome. And you saw what he did with his power. He destroyed his political enemies and people who weren't even his political enemies. He had slaughtered for their estates. It was a bad time. And it's interesting when you read this, uh, all the politics involved and a lot seems familiar. We are fortunate to have the laws that we do that prevents this kind of thing from happening nowadays. But you know, you never know. Some of the events we've seen go on the last couple of years, the last few years, people have not gotten any better than the people who lived at this time. We just happen to have a better government, better philosophy, perhaps, a better respect for human life, maybe. But people themselves are no smarter than the people who lived at this time. We just happen to know more because of science. But people, people as individuals, we're no smarter than the people who lived at this time. We're no better than the people who lived at this time, unfortunately. And so when we read this, a lot of it's pretty relatable. We could, we could see, we could, we, we could relate to a lot of what's going on here. And a lot of it's pretty horrifying. Uh, a lot of terrible things happened um, during this time, the fall of the Roman Republic as it, trans as it transformed in, from being a republic into an empire. And it was an empire for an awful long time yeah, fascinating book. I highly recommend this one. Uh, not just for people who are interested in ancient history, but if you're interested in politics, if you're inter interested in history of any kind, if you just want a good story, Plutarch could tell a good story. I would highly recommend this. As for how factual these biographies are, it's impossible to tell. Plutarch certainly had access uh, to histories that we no longer have access to. Those, that fact in itself makes these valuable. Uh, but sometimes it is impossible to tease out the history from just a good story. We don't know what's, we don't know everything that was true and everything that wasn't true. Not everything. A lot of this stuff, though, was true. Uh, the prescriptions, for example, which uh, I talked about in the passage that I read, that was true. That really happened. Uh, it was a horrifying bloodbath. So, Plutarch's The Fall of the Roman Republic. I highly recommend this. Uh, if you ever have a chance to get the whole thing of the lives of the Greeks and Romans, I recommend that. If you have a Kindle, you can certainly get all of that. You can get the whole thing. So yeah, Plutarch, The Fall of the Roman Republic, your Sunday Penguin, for today. I don't think I'm going to have time to do my Mythos Monday tomorrow. Sorry. Mythos Monday will have to be postponed till next week. This is just a heck of a week. I should have my Tag Tuesday up though. And on my Tag Tuesday this week, it's going to be the Star Trek tag created by Gina Stanier. So that's going to be fun. So I will catch you then. Thanks guys. Have a great day.